Thank you, Hugh. Um, uh, so, uh, yes, Simon Nelson, uh, I'm now, uh, it's now almost a year uh, since I was summoned um, uh, over the road from where I was normally doing business, which was in the MTV building in Hawley Crescent in Camden, uh, to meet Martin Bean uh, in the Open University, uh, Vice Chancellor of the Open University, in the Open University building on Hawley Crescent. Um, and uh, the, the acronym, the appalling acronym MOOC was first uh, uh, described to me. <laughs> um, and uh, a few weeks later I'd agreed to set up this thing. Um, and a few weeks later we announced uh, the launch of uh, FutureLearn uh, in mid-December last year. Um, so it's been quite a journey since, um, but uh, it's a privilege to be here today. Um, at uh, the home of uh, one of uh, my favorite partners. Um, uh, for other partners in the room, you are as well. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I will say that uh, Southampton uh, and Don uh, were um, among the, if not the earliest uh, supporters of what became FutureLearn uh, and have been incredibly supportive and, uh, and guided us along the way, um, and especially Hugh working closely with him. And I cannot wait for the start of their first course on <laughs> Monday. Um, so uh, I'm going to um, give a presentation, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, I hope in it I'm not going to teach uh, a room of world-class uh, learning technologists to suck eggs, um, but I probably will from time to time. Please forgive me if I do, um, and teach you, uh, remind you of some of the basics, like the fact that FutureLearn is a platform for online learning, uh, and we sort of put MOOCs within that. I, I don't say we're exclusively a MOOC platform because I think MOOCs is such an early and emergent market that um, I think this thing could go in a number of different directions, but it's definitely an exciting start point for us. Um, I suspect that this room uh, knows what a MOOC is, um, but uh, our own interpretation, large numbers of students uh, open to all, um, two to six hours study a week, six to ten weeks duration and a high degree of social interaction uh, involved. We uh, have, uh, I hope, a pretty simple uh, and clear vision of what we're trying to do. Uh, inspiring learning for life through uh, telling stories, <coughs> provoking conversation uh, and celebrating progress. Um, of those sort of three points, the most controversial whenever I've uh, spoken <coughs> to uh, academics or partners is always the first one, telling stories, um, but I therefore leave it in very deliberately because I think it provokes exactly the kind of conversation we should be having about how to use the platform of the web uh, to deliver new forms of learning. Uh, and it's also a bias to my previous uh, um, 15 years at the BBC, uh, where I was certainly not, uh, I wouldn't take all the credit that Hugh's just given me for the development of the iPlayer, but I was certainly heavily involved in that. and. Um, uh, uh, the interactive web services for radio and TV. Um, so uh, we deliver through hopefully uh, an expertise in um, distance and online learning uh, drawn from our founder, our owner, uh, the Open University, um, but also that area of, sort of broadcast storytelling. A lot of my team have got that BBC background. Um, but also I'm bringing in sort of digital startup people very grounded in um, the new social tools and technologies uh, that we believe can really bring this thing to life. Uh, and I would say a marriage of those three areas is always the easiest thing, um, but that for me is what FutureLearn is about and uh, that's what the, sort of the beauty of our ownership structure and our relationship with the Open University uh, potentially gives us. Um, so I'm able to draw on uh, world-class um, uh, talent from uh, the academic uh, side of the Open University. Mike Sharples, my academic lead, I'm drawing on world-class experts like Simon Buckingham Shum in the area of learning analytics. Um, and as I say, you know, my background, media, Martin Bean, uh, my, vice, uh, my chairman, vice chancellor of the OU, uh, education technology. Um, so if we can get those sort of things working well together, and I think we have done so far, um, then uh, I think we're on to something, particularly if we can exploit uh, these amazing relationships that we've uh, been able to build up so far. So 26 partners, um, 23 uh, UK, 3 international, 
um, and uh, the latest to come on board, University of Auckland, uh, Newcastle, and Liverpool, um, but uh, an extremely powerful group of uh, universities in my view, um, and uh, I think increasingly starting to, uh, we're starting to see some of the collaborative potential uh, of this grouping. I'm very clear that with FutureLearn we're nothing without our partners and actually we have to be really, really good at building a product and a platform for online learning but also at working with uh, these partnerships because uh, if we do that then I do think there's very exciting uh, innovations that are going to come out from the collective partnership. Um, there are a whole range of different uh, motivations I think that bring those partners uh, within the FutureLearn family, uh, but I think uh, the potential for global reach um, is, uh, is a key sort of common driver, uh, but also that opportunity to experiment. Uh, experiment in a new uh, MOOC uh, landscape uh, and experiment in terms of uh, online uh, learning, online delivery of uh, their existing um, expertise. Um, I sort of I class these five broad motivations as uh, uh, some combination of each, I think, um, powers most of our university partners. Um, it's not only academic partners. Um, we have uh, three high-class content partners who we're working with, uh, and our vision for these is to uh, use them to augment the uh, content, the courses that are coming out of the universities, um, but also potentially to co-create uh, uh, some of those courses and, uh, and to place uh, the, the, the actual online learning at the heart of a broader online knowledge offer, uh, drawing in the digital archives of, for example, the museum, the library, etc. And behind these there's a whole range of other potential partners, cultural, content, commercial, um, who are uh, interested in working with the university sector to uh, bring these new forms of learning to life. Um, I don't have the BBC up there, but um, it won't surprise you to know I've been working quite hard on them uh, over the last year. Um, and uh, last week, no, two weeks ago, uh, they announced uh, the first collaboration with FutureLearn and its universities uh, as part of its uh, centenary of World War I commemorations. Um, so we're uh, working on the first um, uh, potential uh, courses to come out of there. Um, and so uh, not only uh, cultural uh, corporate bodies, um, so uh, commercial, first commercial corporate partner, uh, British Telecom. Uh, and I'd say that uh, my approach to British Telecom, as with those first three content partners, is about uh, piloting uh, different ways of working with the universities and then using what we learn from them to open up to a wider range of potential partners. Um, so watch this space there. So we're up and running. Uh, our first courses uh, are, um, are out there at the moment. Uh, course uh, four uh, launched this week, uh, The Mind is Flat. Uh, from the University of Warwick um, and uh, we'll be uh, running eight in total by the back end of this year um, and uh, as I say uh, web science starts on Monday um, and uh, uh, I'm very much enjoying the experience of uh, working through some of these uh, courses. So we're not in here just to sort of copy you know, this emerging uh, MOOC landscape, we do think we can bring something new. We think we can bring something fresh, something different to this, uh, this area um, if we really exploit um, those uh, partnerships with our universities uh, and bring that open university and social web development together. Um, so, we're particularly excited about the idea of transforming the convenience and accessibility uh, of learning by making it available uh, at times of the day uh, and on devices and in locations where traditionally 
people wouldn't have had the opportunity to learn. So we've heavily prioritised mobile learning. Uh, we've made sure that we've developed the whole FutureLearn platform uh, in a responsive way so that it renders appropriately on small mobile phone device, a tablet, uh, as well as on a desktop or laptop. Um, and surprisingly, I think that already uh, puts us a little ahead of the game of some of the existing providers out there, although I'm sure they're catching up very quickly. Um, there's a lot further to go in here. Uh, I want to be providing offline access in some way, um, not least for myself. Uh, the metro system of, the, uh, of London, of course, is the perfect environment uh, to get through some of those uh, six-minute videos. Um, so um, watch this space on there, and we're also intrigued by some of the other potential that uh, native uh, app environments could, uh, could provide us. Um, I want to emphasize we've launched in beta, we've done that very deliberately. Uh, I would say that uh, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of the beta product we've put out there, but I'd say at the moment it's the foundations of what FutureLearn is going to become. It's not the end product. Uh, and in some ways I sort of think we maybe should always stay in beta because I'm never getting rid of my development team. There's always going to be the next innovation to come. We're always going to be learning from what happened in the last month and hopefully iterating rapidly that product uh, in order to get it better. We'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. Um, but uh, as I say, uh, you can now go to FutureLearn. I'm, I'm hoping uh, many of the second experience. Um, so uh, learners can just go on and join that course. Um, as I say, um, I think we've got, the, the thing I asked my team to prioritise was the foundations, the core architecture. I remember at the BBC, um, I'm very proud of a huge amount of stuff that we built and developed and uh, the audiences we reached, the innovations we reached and so on, but there were a few things that I just could never do well. One of them was mobile, and another one was social. And that's because I was building on a legacy system, a sort of Frankenstein technology platform that had started uh, in 1997 with the BBC News site. And in fact, the original architect of that site um, was uh, my uh, lead technologist at the start of this project. Because um, the thing has managed to grow to go however many tens of millions, billions of pages or whatever, based on that same architecture that was designed at the beginning. But to then actually, you know, turn that oil tanker to do social simply and well was almost impossible. So the priority for the team has been fewer bells and whistles, but get that functionality, get that architecture in place so that we can grow, we can build on it, etc. I think they've done that superbly. Um, so um, the sort of core ar architecture is one's to-do list. Uh, with uh, hopefully a clear representation of the course structure, how many weeks you are, where you are in that um, cycle at the moment. You've got your steps underneath. Um, you can um, watch an individual uh, bit of video, read an article, uh, join in a discussion. Uh, and once you've done that, uh, you uh, self-complete uh, by uh, marking something as complete. And that then tracks back to your to-do list. You can see what you've done, what you've still got to do, what's coming up next etc. So again, a huge amount we're learning about this area from our first, um, uh, uh, first experiments with it really. You know, what, how does it feel if you've only ticked off you know, uh, three quarters of week one and week two's already begun? You know, how do we communicate to the learner that that's sort of okay? Is it okay for the course structure? Um, and, um, and then what, what counts as complete? Um, so uh, these are, these are you know, very interesting questions for us. Um, we've heavily prioritised, as I say, these aspects of social learning. Uh, we think that um, learning together is one of the key opportunities that uh, the web offers um, um, to develop on um, uh, 
uh, where we're coming from. And um, so, uh, and I, I've been absolutely blown away by uh, the first uh, real learner reaction to these features. So I'll be honest with you, we put them out going, okay, at the moment they're not that sophisticated. You know, there are basically long discussions. Uh, it's very hard to filter at the moment. Uh, we haven't got the opportunity for small group discussion. I promise you all of this is coming. We have all sorts of ways that we're going to be able to manage large numbers of, uh, large amounts of social activity. But we, sort of, we, we decided we're in beta, we want to get this out there. The reaction's been amazing. And the volume of take up, the, the quantity and quality of discussion in these environments, again, vindicating, I think, some of the early decisions we took to place the discussion at the heart of the content rather than send people off into different environments uh, to discuss a chat, etc. Um, but if you go through one of our courses, um, then I think you really do find, um, and, and there's something about uh, any, anyone who's been involved with a MOOC development, and um, I'm sure, you know, there's Amy from Edinburgh at the back there, who's uh, been, uh, you know, one of the UK pioneers in this area. I'm sure you'll agree. There is a, there is a moment where you actually see real people in there uh, talking, and uh, it brings it to life in a way that's quite uh, inspiring, really thrilling, and uh, particularly on something so global. I mean, you get people introducing themselves. I'm from Peru, I'm from Korea, I'm from you know, Nigeria, I'm from China. I, I want to learn this, I'm here for this. I work you know, part-time doing this and have time in the evening. I'm trying to navigate around my two-year-old toddler who's helping me do this. It's, it's brilliant the way you see this come to life and the communities that build around it. And as I say, we're scratching the surface of what's possible here at the moment. Um, our first basic filtering um, techniques are in there. We're, we're drawing on uh, the principles from social media that we believe the core audience is very familiar with. Um, so the ability to follow uh, people who you're particularly interested in um, and uh, be able to then filter uh, your discussions by um, uh, filter the social activity you view uh, by the people you follow. Uh, I'll show you a couple of things that are coming soon as well in that area. Um, and uh, our first assessment tools are in place. Uh, and the key here is to try and you know, use these as formative um, uh, experiences. So try and develop learning, not just test it. Um, and it's interesting, you know, working with bringing together those different cultures in my team. Um, there have been times when, you know, uh, I'd say the, the sort of web development side has come at an issue like assessment, uh, multiple choice quizzes, and gone, how hard can that be? And, and then we've sort of brought in the, the pedagogic experts from the OU and gone, okay, we've got a bit to learn about this. And um, again, that sort of, uh, that fusion of those skills, um, I mean, it's challenging, because you know, we're trying to do this in a MOOC environment, in a free environment, so finding the right area to pitch this at um, is, is key. But, our, but we're also there, we know that we've got you know, the brands of the Open University and all our partners behind us, so we want to make damn sure that what we're putting out there is quality. Uh, and I think in just something as, as basic as um, uh, multiple choice quizzes at the moment, um, we have uh, put a lot of thinking into it uh, into the ability, how many tries people get for an individual question, uh, what happens when they get one right or wrong, um, making sure that we provide hints from the educator, uh, send people back to uh, the areas where they might be able to um, go over their uh, learning again in order to get that right, um, track their progress through um, and, uh, and score appropriately. And again, these are our first weeks of this. Uh, we're still learning what works, what's appropriate, etc. Um, but again, in, in all of these areas, we're just looking to pick them off and do them well, but appropriately for a MOOC space. So coming soon, um, and you can imagine my day job is, is tied up with you know, a roadmap of things we could do and making sure we prioritise those appropriately. Um, but uh, one of the things um, that's starting to come in now is little in test assess uh, in those kind of areas uh, and we've got other uh, demands for for example audio in quizzes and audio testing and comparison and video etc um, and uh, also um, 
there's uh, sort of innovative HTML5 apps, etc., that we want to embed uh, into uh, some of our courses to enable us to really exploit the interactive potential uh, of the medium. So to do some, you know, whizzy, funkier stuff uh, around content. Coming soon. Uh, peer review and assessment. Um, so peer review, uh, we're going to be starting with it. That's a heavy priority for us uh, because, again, we think that that... Uh, that hits several sweet spots of where we believe the MOOC space has to be and not least our social um, uh, uh, aspects of, of utilising the crowd. Um, so uh, these are you know, early designs uh, for what's coming um, and actually is going to be tested uh, quite shortly, uh, uh, we are hoping, um, maybe with uh, uh, Southampton. Um, so... Um, then uh, some of those aspects of you know, actually utilising these crowds in, in slightly more sophisticated ways. Uh, so group discussions, um, uh, again, that's, a, that's an early priority. Uh, and then there are um, much more uh, uh, sort of ambitious and sophisticated ways that we could do this. Uh, forms of jigsaw learning, argue graphs, some of you will be familiar with those concepts. Um, and uh, we definitely, you know, I have people like Mike Sharples just ready to unleash themselves on on the tools we give them uh, in order to uh, try and innovate in these kind of areas. Uh, filtering those discussions, um, so uh, what, one of the things that we found um, in, in our alpha test um, was that there was a person going around all the comments and replying to lots of them going, just saying like, and he just dotted all around and kept saying like, 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 thought, oh okay, maybe we need a like button. Um, <laughs> And, and it's true, you know, because you, you go through and you do, you know, you see these incredibly warm sort of uh, responses or incredibly, you know, clever responses and you don't necessarily always want to reply to them. Just want to, you know, hit like. Uh, and so uh, the ability to like stuff, to filter stuff in that way um, and, uh, you know, experiment around you know, how do you scale, how do you filter uh, social activity. Um, and critically, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm really sort of, uh, it's really coming home to me. It already was there, you know, celebrating progress is a key part of our vision. Um, but, you know, what, trying to understand what a learner's uh, targets are, what success means for them, moving beyond the sort of crude, you know, retention completion rates that are sort of, you know, that the, the media is obsessed by, potentially correctly, but... Um, there's something more sophisticated going on in here, and if we design these courses in the right way, then you know some people are going to come in and get you know chunks of learning that actually we should celebrate, we should maybe reward them for, um, and uh, we're trying to find uh, interesting ways to sort of uh, visualise um, and uh, and use uh, a learner's data, uh, play it back to them so that they can um, uh, to improve their own experience and, and set their own targets. Um, data, uh, I'd say, is a, a, the lifeblood of the future learn offer. Go back to the BBC again. Um, you know, 15 year old uh, platform basically powering BBC, getting sophisticated data and analytics, never mind then reacting rapidly to it. Again, really, really difficult for a legacy business. Future learn doesn't have that excuse um, and has all of that opportunity. Uh, so uh, we're putting heavy emphasis on what we can do here and we just see the benefits um, for learners, uh, for the educator themselves, for partners as a whole and for future learn the product and the company um, as, uh, as manifold and actually critical to our success. Um, so uh, helping learners to uh, track progress, set targets, uh, understand how they're doing. Uh, educators, you know, if we get the right kind of dashboards in front of them, provide them with dynamic um, and powerful data, uh, then they will, um, that will help to improve the courses we are making. Uh, for partners, there's no doubt that um, you know, this is an opportunity to reach new students and to reach out into parts of the world uh, where the traditional physical uh, university has not been able to. Um, but also, all of them are interested in uh, the research potential of this sort of big learning data uh, and we're trying as a partnership to find the right ways to uh, collaborate um, and to make those opportunities available. Uh, and then, of course, for FutureLearn, you know, we have to be a learning operation. 
Um, we have our first learners on the platform. What are they telling us? What questions are they asking? Um, so I'll, I'll give you a few that are sort of exercising me at the moment. Um, I will say I don't think there's any... What one of the things about you know the, this area is, I don't believe there's a one-size-fits-all solution to what a MOOC is, um, but I do think there's stuff we can learn from uh, everything we're doing. So in the first uh, few weeks, we have had um, a 10-week course uh, start. We've had a two-week course start and finish. Uh, we've had a six-week and eight-week course. I'm very interested to see what we can learn about the different um, uh, rates of progress through there. Um, I spoke about that number of steps that people are doing per week. Um, what's appropriate? What does it mean? You know, how do you uh, structure a course in, in case the majority of people are only getting three quarters of the way through an individual week of steps? I don't know, but these are the kind of things that um, I want to put in front of our um, educators, really, and get them playing around with and, and testing. Um, video characteristics and length. I, I, I was going through a course the other day and you know, watched an incredibly stimulating seven-minute piece of video that then was confronted with an 11 minute piece of video and just in my own head a trigger went I just can't justify that time now I'm gonna there's just something about understanding ideal durations um, ideal sort of scheduling of a course understanding the sort of rhythms and pattern of the learner again no one-size-fits-all solution but you can imagine the the depth and quality of data that's going to be coming back course by course um, uh, and across the whole piece um, Marketing and scheduling courses. Um, scheduling was a word, is a word I've sort of used a lot, bringing it in from TV. Um, I remember when I moved from BBC Radio to BBC TV, I was blown away by this sort of this engine they had of sort of planning and scheduling, um, uh, planning, commissioning, and scheduling courses. So they analysed the hell out of what they thought viewers would want. Uh, then they commissioned and you know went over everything with a fine tooth comb through a very long production process, etc. And then, in terms of knowing exactly who would be there at what time, what they would be interested in, what else they might be doing, you know, this was down to an art. Some would say they've actually replaced some of the art with science in doing that. But if you can get the right balance, it's amazingly effective. We're nowhere near that yet. And I think again, as a partnership, as an operation. You know, I, I want to get um, much more into much more of a dialogue with all of our partners about you know understanding what works here, what learner appetite is, what learners we're after, uh, and then um, all of us learning how to market to them. You know, because um, there's a web, web science course starting on Monday. Does everyone who would be interested in that know that it's ahead? the early stages here were in beta? But you know what? That is a key discipline we all need to learn. And actually, it's not something that is traditionally, I think, in, in, in our makeup. Titling. Uh, I will make no comment, but if you go through our title list, you'll see some things that are really clear, do what they say on the tin, and, and really suck you in. Um, uh, you'll see others that, that maybe don't, are a bit more confusing, etc. We cannot just translate the traditional university sort of course uh, titles, etc., into this environment. To be fair, I don't think anyone really is, but. Um, we need to get good at this. Um, uh, how open should we be? Um, so this is uh, what, one of the things that's in sort of my lifeblood and uh, the rest of the team is, um, is actually making things open, discoverable, shareable. Um, but it's sort of like a paywall argument with a newspaper, you know. Where, how much should you open up pre-registration so that you can really take the benefits of that, you know, discoverability that what the web can offer. Um, but then encourage people or even force them to register in order to take part of the whole experience. Uh, I'm running out of time. Use of email, key marketing tool. We need to get really good at it. Um, uh, learner expectations and targets. That's progression I've spoken about. And sort of from all of that, what are the right metrics uh, to measure success or failure for this? Um, because um, I think it's a lot more sophisticated than some of the traditional ones out there in the market. Um, First demographics, uh, so um, pretty balanced, pretty typical. I think um, Helen is going to give uh, a bit more uh, insight into some of the uh, learners that she's had on uh, the power of brands. So uh, I'll just leave that for a sec while you take your photo. Uh, and then I'll, I'll move on and end by uh, with um, uh, the only stats I'm sort of putting out there publicly at the moment. Um, 
So we actually got 20,000 people in the first 24 hours, but I've, I've just adapted it to say 25,000 people in the first day or so after launch because it juxtaposes beautifully uh, with uh, something that my chairman uh, said to me, which is uh, that in its first year uh, after foundation, the Open University uh, had 25,000 uh, mm -hmm. students. And uh, so I think in just over a day, um, FutureLearn um, uh, registered 25,000 people from over 150 countries. I find that dead exciting um, as I do the whole FutureLearn proposition. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to take some questions.